Welcome to the Mark Edit webinar series. The first webinar in this five webinar series will focus on working with Mark data in Mark Edit, including breaking and making, processing and batch, handling character conversions, and dealing with errors and invalid records. Carly is pleased to have Terry Reese presenting on Mark Edit. Terry is the head of Dig digital initiatives at the Ohio State University and is the creator and develop developer of the Mark Edit software. Um, I will now turn the mic over to Terry. Okay, so hopefully everybody can hear me. Uh, my name is Terry, and I'm going to see uh, how we do with this. So I'm just going to let folks know that um, usually when I like to do this stuff, I like to bounce in and out between the presentation and actually touching the program. So hopefully that will be a fairly seamless process, but we'll see. Um, as uh, Jen had mentioned, we've got... Uh, um, the topic today is primarily working with MARC data, so that's going to be primarily the bi binary MARC data and how you can um, do lots of things with the files. Um, I'm going to primarily hit on um, the breaking, the making, splitting, stuff like that using the comparison tools, um, merging data, um, and then we'll talk about validating since um, I'm sure you guys use vendor records and uh, at least in my experience they definitely need validating. Um, later. We'll have topics specifically on um, non-MARC data. So if you're interested in um, how MARC edit works with XML and delimited data, databases, XML, XML uh, Excel data, um, we'll have some, a topic on MARC edit and RDA, in which I'll probably slip in um, a discussion about what we're doing around linked data as well. Um, there'll be um, a discussion around automatic record editing, which is largely going to be what happens within the MARC editor itself which is Mark Edit's handy notepad for doing batch and global edits. And then there'll be a, a session for those who really want to try and figure out how to um, automate with Mark Edit using the um, scripting interfaces um, and the command line tools. So that's kind of the plan going forward. So for today, let's see if I can figure out how to make this go forward. There we go. So for today, what I thought I would do is um, I'm going to give a, a brief introduction um, of Mark Edit. Uh, if you've used the tool before, this will, be, this will go very quickly. Uh, we'll talk about uh, making and breaking records in Mark and what that means, um, because Mark Edit tries to um, provide you with uh, uh, a step, essentially steps, a workflow for working with records. We'll talk about processing records in batch. Those are just for instances, but there's other things. Um, handling character conversions and then dealing with invalid records, and it's not going to be in that order, so hopefully you guys don't mind. So, all right, so let's go ahead and get started. So I've been working on this for a very long time, and it actually uh, is um, uh, a little bit depressing when I think about exactly how long I've been working on this. Um, you think you'd get it right eventually, but I actually started on working on this when I was a student, um, and it was at the University of Oregon because somebody asked me if there was a better way to do MARC records than working with a uh, passport. Uh, yeah. I guess it was. I guess that would have been the old DOS version for uh, for OCLC, and so uh, this was how I learned how to do Mark records. I decided to to write a tool to work with them um, in their binary data. So it originally was written in Assembly, uh, Visual Basic, and uh, Delphi, um, and it worked um, as a replacement for LC's DOS-based tools, specifically on newer based. Uh, Windows operating systems. Um, and if you've been using Mark Edit for a very long time, this is what it used to look like. This is uh, uh, Mark Edit 1 and 2. Um, it's a, a sad looking tool, but it still runs. I actually, uh, I actually ran it so that I could get these pictures. I was pleasantly surprised. Uh, today, the tool's written in C Sharp. Um, there was some reasons for doing that, one of them being that I'm part of um, an open source development effort to take uh, Microsoft.NET tools and um, port them over into uh, Linux and uh, Mac-based systems. Uh, so MarkEdit was one of the uh, reference applications that we used for testing a number of those uh, components as we were making it work through. Uh, it's still freely available. Anybody can download it and use it if they want to. Um, it supports both UTF-8 and MARC-8 character sets. Uh, it actually supports a wide variety of character sets, and we'll explain how that works. Um, by default, the program is actually all Unicode-based. MARC-8 is basically supported as a legacy format. 
everything that happens within the tool happens in Unicode, even if you're working in Mark 8. It just gets translated back to Mark 8 for you um, as part of that process. I look forward to the day when I'll never have to work with Mark 8 again, although I'm not sure when that'll ever be. Um, it's Mark neutral. I like to think of it as Mark agnostic. Um, and what I mean by that is Mark Edit doesn't prescribe any particular mark format. Uh, there are most, probably everybody on this call knows lots of different flavors of mark. Uh, and mark edits used around, uh, used globally around the world. Um, I uh, keep somewhat uh, track of, of how the tool is being used. And, and at any given point in time over any month, there's um, individuals from roughly about 190 different countries um, that are making use of the tool. Uh, and because of that, you just can't support Mark 21. So the tool tries to make very few assumptions about how Mark records are handled, uh, which means that Mark Edit is, um, is, is very uh, particular when it reads the, the leader information, since that's where um, the Mark record configures itself to tell you, is it two indicators, nine indicators? Um, so anyways, the tool, the tool does that. And so um, that's kind of how that works. There are a handful of places in the tool where um, some Mark 21 assumptions are used. And I'm going to show you one in the merge tool. Um, and when that happens, it tries to make sure that you understand that that's going on so that um, you understand the assumptions that are being made. Uh, the tool's mark uh, is XML aware. Um, the program, uh, we'll talk about this more later um, when we talk about non-mark formats. The program uses mark XML as kind of a, a control in between um, uh, mediated uh, format to allow you to move metadata um, between uh, multiple formats supporting XQuery and uh, XSLT and a variety of other standards. Uh, the program um, has uh, 32 and 64-bit installers for Windows. It can be installed on Macs and Linux versions, although your mileage will end up varying. Uh, it works much better on Linux than on a Mac, um, although I'm trying to work on that. Uh, the, the process is just, it's, it's complicated, um, making it work on all the, the variety of platforms, and I've been trying to target those that are used most often. Um, uh, I'm hoping maybe at some point I can set aside, I, I really need about three to six months to really do the work that I need to do to make it work on a Mac. Um, because that means rewriting the interface, but um, it just it, it just haven't had the time to do it. But it does work on Max and Linux systems. I know there are people working with it on a Max and Linux system, and I will continue to uh, try to make it work better um, on both of those. Um, all right, so let's go ahead and start. So what is um, so what is the place where you're going to do most of your Mark data work? So Mark Edit breaks itself down into a number of different. Uh, tools and here in a minute when I uh, pull up the program we'll talk about those as we kind of go through them as we break out of the slides. Um, Mark Edit has a section called Mark Tools and this is for all intents and purposes the the public interface um, of the Mark Engine. Now the Mark Engine is the 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 the, the, the knowledge base, basically, the, the, the main component, the brains that understands how to deal with Mark data uh, in all its flavors and forms. It's also where Mark Edit has a number of different um, algorithms to handle Mark data. Uh, Mark is a very um, unforgiving format. And Mark Edit has included a number of different tools that um, make it a little more forgiving, um, both in terms of handling character conversions as well as um, handling HTML encoded data, which shouldn't be in Mark records but shows up there every now and again. Um, just a lot of different things to try and help make um, life easier as you go through the process. Um, so this is the this is the the main. Um, way of looking at it. So you have an input, import and an output file. Um, all the functions below it, will, the mark maker, mark breaker, those are kind of the two legacy formats for dealing with mark data. Um, you'll see that there are checkboxes below for translating mark 8 and translating UTF-8 data. Um, those are shortcuts. The assumptions that are being made there, if you're translating to mark 8 data using that checkbox, mark edit makes the assumption that all of the data in your file is either in Mark 8 or in UTF-8. And what you want is you want your data in Mark 8. So it'll go through and it'll process your data that way. Um, if you check the translate to UTF-8, it makes the opposite assumption that your data is either in, well, the same assumption, your data is either in Mark 8 or UTF-8 and you want your data in UTF-8. And it goes about making those translations as well. Um, 
It also, this is where you get access to the XML subroutines. You'll see that I have a long list here that aren't in most people's mark um, edit implementations. I create a lot of these for folks. Um, and so you see kind of the list of some of the ones that show up there. Um, I try to make them available if they're generic enough um, through mark edit or through um, a tool that they're in mark edit to search for uh, materials that I've tossed up on, the web on my website as well as stuff that I make available to people normally just to use. All right, so the, the built-in functions, mark tool, mark built-in functions, we'll, we'll look at all of these. There's the mark breaker, which converts records from mark to mark at its mnemonic format, and I'll show you that in a second. The mark maker takes data from the mnemonic format and turns it back into mark. Um, you can go directly from mark to mark XML, and there are two different ways of doing that. Um, one is using um, a native SACS-based um, processor. Uh, one is using XSLT. Uh, the XSLT version allows you to modify the way that the uh, process works. The native base function does not. Um, the difference between the two also is the native base function um, has no memory requirements or, or no memory limitations. You can process as large a file as you can store on your hard drive. Um, the largest file I've ever processed of Mark XML data. Um, using that tool was the Hattie Trust, and it was roughly um, 300 um, gigabytes of data. Um, that is uh, almost that is actually impossible to process using the uh, the the XSLT version um, because of the way XSLT works. Um, and then there's um, uh, Mark X 21 XML to Mark conversion, which will take your data uh, back to Mark. Um, with the two XML conversions, when, when MarkEdit converts data to XML, it always converts it to UTF-8. When MarkEdit converts XML data back to Mark, it does not automatically convert it back to Mark-8. It leaves the data in UTF-8, and it makes the assumption that if you want the data in Mark-8, you're going to tell it. Um, so that's kind of how that works. All right, so let's go ahead and talk about um, some settings here, and I'm going to uh, talk about this, and I'm going to bounce out to the program and show you where this lives so we can um, look at, um, talk about how this works and a couple of other things that I just want to highlight that I put in the slides. Um, so Mark Edit handles um, character conversions, um, and this is an important part of the, the program when you first get started. So when you first run Mark Edit for the very first time, this box pops up. It's the preferences box, and most people are just going to click OK, and for most folks, that's going to be exactly what they need to do. Hit OK, and then you're good to go. Uh, but you have to remember Mark Edit um, is uh, Mark agnostic. So there's a lot of information that gets set in that OK button press. One of them is telling Mark Edit what language you're using. It's going to make an assumption that it's English unless it can determine something else from your operating system. Um, and it's going to set the language identifier so that the um, language file that's pulled to generate the UI is going to be that specific language. Um, it's going to make some assumptions around the Mark Engine, which is this box here that you're seeing. Um, one of them, there are general assumptions using diacritics and that your records are in Mark 21. Um, if your records are not in Mark 21, then you would want to uncheck that. Um, that's primarily um, for the Mark Engine to know where to set um, the byte that tells the record if it's in Unicode or not. Um, it's in a different place if it's not Mark 21, in a different flavor of Mark. So you tell Mark, you tell Mark Edit um, if it's Mark 21 or not. Um, the use diacritics when breaking is um, pretty much everybody will use. Uh, it's very rarely that, um, and it's generally international users that are um, using uh, non. Unicode non Mark 8 uh, character sets uh, like Big Five or something like that that would check the uncheck that box and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, there's the uh, XML options where you have Mark XML, uh, the Mark X XML XSLT. Uh, that's the XSLT file that Mark Edit uses to translate um, Mark 21 data um, into Mark. Uh, Mark 21 XML data into Mark. Uh, it doesn't use that by default. Um, it uses, by default, it's going to check that use native option, uh, which is the faster option that uses the SACS processor. If you don't want to use it, you can uncheck it, and then you can do whatever you want to with the XSLT file. Um, I always like to use namespaces. helps disambiguate uh, data that you're working with, but you can decide not to use it. There are reasons to not use it, primarily file size. Uh, it's one of those things that's um, up to you, so you can give that a go. Uh, let's see here. Uh, okay. Um, the other thing that we have is uh, there's the XSLT engine, 
market, it has um, multiple uh, XSLT engines embedded into it. One is the uh, one that comes with .NET, which is um, optimized and faster, um, but it only supports XQuery and XSLT 1.0. Uh, it's the one that gets picked by default. There's a Saxon.net, which supports um, XQuery 2 and uh, parts of 3, as well as um, XSLT 2. Uh, so if you need that group set, you can select that as your global option, but you can also select it um, individually for individual um, XSLT operations. So that would be something we'll look at later. Um, Unicode uh, normalization. This is one of those things I like to highlight because as more and more users end up using um, UTF-8 data, especially as they use UTF-8 data outside of their library systems, um, understanding the differences is important. Not all Unicode data is, um, is uh, the same. Um, in fact, uh, UTF-8 has, I believe, six normalizations four that are primarily used, two that are important to us. Um, there's the uh, KD, the compatibility decomposition, which is the one that the Library of Congress recommends. And it's primarily for lossless conversion between UTF-8 and Mark-8 and Mark-8 back to UTF-8. Um, what it does is it um, takes a, uh, a character with an accent, so like, as I say, an, an A with an accent mark over it, and it in Mark 8, that's going to be represented by two code points. There's going to be two bytes that represent that character. Um, in the KD notation, there will continue to be two bytes that represent that character, um, which has implications for indexing. If you're indexing the data, you're going to probably index the uh, diacritic instead of the, the character with the diacritic over it um, from your from your display perspective, it's going to look like a, a character with a diacritic over it. But from your um, indexer's perspective, it won't. Um, the canonical decomposition, which is what I find a lot of international users have to use, um, or users that are taking their data um, out of MARC and putting it into another system, um, the canonical decomposition uh, moves away from that um, implementation where you have two bytes, uh, two code points for uh, an A with an apostrophe over it, and combines them to a single code point. So a single um, a single element represents that A with an accent mark. Um, so MarkEdit gives you the option to choose one or the other. Uh, program's also smart enough to, um, if you pick the canonical decomposition, to still be lossless in converting between Mark 8 and UTF-8. It does some things in the background to kind of make that easier, and that's primarily uh, for international users to help make their transition between the data, uh, the, between those silos a little bit easier. Um, but that's that's important to understand how that works. All right, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to start... Uh, Talking and then breaking out um, from my uh, from my slides and picking up the application, so we can talk specifically about um, how the program works. Um, so I'm I'm hoping that this will be a a, straight, a seamless process. So MarkEdit has a number of um, utilities uh, that allows you to work directly with the Mark data. Um, there's the ability to export. Uh, you can see on the left, there's an export tab delimited records. There's a way to join lots of records together, to split records, to convert records by character, merge them, and process them in batch. So this is the, uh, the character conversion tool. Um, you can see that you've asked for a source file and a destination file, and then you have an encoding and a final encoding file. Unfortunately, MarkEdit has no way of being able to determine what your file encodings are. You have to tell it. And that can be somewhat problematic if you're getting data from somewhere and you don't know what the character encoding is, which happens every now and again. Um, if that happens and you, you're not sure what it is, you can, you can actually ask the listserv. There's a mark edit listserv. And, and if I'm trolling the list, I can usually get a few pretty good idea. I, I have the, all of the encodings that are, um, that are defined with on mark edit, uh, I see fairly often. So I've, I've gotten fairly good at being able to tell the difference. Um, unfortunately, I have to actually see them to tell the difference. Um, mark edits and codings, though, there are the ones that I see most often. Um, but then there are also some special use character encodings. Um, so for example, um, actually, let me go ahead and pop this out so we can look at it. So I believe the way I do this is I stop sharing, and then I am going to share my screen. And it is going to use the plugin. Oh, 
Maybe it popped me up. Let's see. Share my screen. My desktop. All right. I believe folks can see it now. Yes. Let me see. There's a comment. Ah, great. Okay, you see it. All right. So, all right. So, so here's my screen. So this is what Mark Edit looks like when you first open it up. Um, this is the, the main um, application here, um, so I can see what everybody can see. Um, this is actually something that's configurable, um, that when you open up your uh, preferences window here, um, you actually, the very first screen that you have is you can uncheck and check the programs that you want to see. That's really done so you can decide what programs you want to use. And this is also where the mark adding engine settings are set. So. Um, just wanted to make sure that um, that is uh, easy to find. All right, so for character conversions, there's lots of different places where you can find this information. Um, most of these are going to, you can either get them from here, which is the, the drop down list. Some of them, um, some of them are very specific to the mark tools. This is one of them. So uh, character conversion tools, I'm just going to go ahead and select other. All right, so this is the character conversion tool. What I'm going to do is I'm going to grab a big five file. And um, I know it's a big five file um, because I've looked at it. So actually, let's let's look at it really quick. So our big five file, um, we are going to, we'll remember this once after we do this once. All right, so here's my big five file. And we'll execute it, and we'll look at it, and it is going to look uh, very unuseful. Um, this is sadly what a, a Mark 8, uh, is it a Mark 8? No, this is a big five file. The reason why you can tell this is a big five file and not a Mark 8 file is there's no escape sequences in it. Um, and so Mark Edit, when it runs across data that it doesn't understand, it has to translate it into some kind of mnemonic. It uses the mnemonic codes that uh, are related to um, the uh, the Mark 8 character set, and what you end up getting is you get something that is pretty useless. Um, so that that is not useful. So what I can do is I can convert that data um, into uh, something that's more useful. So what we'll do is we'll convert that data to um, we'll convert that data to um, Unicode. So what we'll do is we'll tell Mark Edit that the data is in Big Five format. So these are the ones that I see most often. So there's Central European, Cyrillic, Western European. Uh, you can read them all. The only one that's not um, used a lot is this one down on the bottom. It's the ISO 5426. This is actually a dead encoding, but a number of um, libraries in France use it um, in Unimark and in the process of helping them convert their data into a more, um, into a more familiar format that's been included. Uh, so we're going to choose um, traditional Chinese. That's the big five format. Now, MarkEdit supports any character encoding that your operating system supports. So on Windows, um, and I'll, I'll make sure that I include it. Um, I'll, I'll put this somewhere in a note. Um, there is a, an actual code page page that you can go to, which includes all of the code pages that, it, that Windows supports, which is a lot of them. There's something like two or 300. And some of them are dead. Um, so you actually have a wide range of code pages that you can support. So in this case, I'm going to go to UTF-8. I'm going to go ahead and save the file. Big 5 UTF-8. Whoops, I guess I have to select, sorry, select the file. Now I'm going to save the file. Eight, and then we'll go ahead and process it, and it's done. And now if we go and look at that file, and process it, and look at it, we will see that the data is now um, a UTF-8. Um, so the data actually can be used within a, a system that, that works with uh, UTF-8 data. Um, and I just have to take the word for it that all the data that I have here is uh, something good. Um, if I'm a Mark 8 user and I can't use the UTF-8 data, I can go directly from Big 5, but it's actually just as easy now that my data is in, um, uh, now that my data is in uh, UTF-8. Um, actually, I, I could do it down there. I'll go through the conversions. Through the character conversions, I could start at big five and go directly to UTF-8. It's a, it's a, 
a nice seamless process to go from here, so I'll just go from here, make my life easier. And process, and the data gets done. And then I can take a peek at that. And we can tell this is different um, than the first one that we looked at. Equally horrible, I believe. I, I still would say that this is probably useless um, if you were a user who wanted to actually edit um, uh, data that was in uh, um, a uh, Asian language, um, because this is primarily an escape-based language. You'd have to know all the escapes. But this is in Mark 8, so I could load this into a Mark, Mark 8-based system. Um, a, a handy little uh, tip, if I was going to do this, and this is what I recommend for people doing workflows, if you're working with um, uh, data that, that needs to be um, in a language that uh, is an escape-based language or even a, uh, and you want to work with it and actually enter the, the characters that you're working with within the Mark Editor, when you're done, you can actually compile the data directly back to um, Mark 8. So from here, you can select whether you're just going to compile it back as a mark file, which will take whatever the character encoding happens to be that you happen to be using. Um, you can select specifically that you want the data compiled back to Mark 8, and Mark Edit will translate the data. It knows what your encoding is because it, uh, it figured that out when it opened the program, uh, when it opened the file. And so it will take that and convert it back to Mark 8 for you on the fly. And so then you don't have to ever see those awful um, escape sequences. Um, or you can tell it uh, vice versa. You could be working in a Mark 8 encoded data field and want to translate it always to UTF-8. So um, there's kind of a shortcut when you're working in a mnemonic file format to get to and from um, where you're at. So the character conversion tool, um, like I said, it does those for particular uh, flavors and then anything else that's, uh, that's down there. So um, I think you have um, a good deal of flexibility there in terms of, of working with different coding. So let me see, go back to the, see if we can do this seamlessly. So stop sharing and then we'll go back to, and let's see if it's the same. Ha, ha, it even came back to the same spot. <laughs> Seamless. Okay, so this would be where we were at, character conversions. All right, so um, mark split. Uh, mark split is a tool that you use to uh, take a mark record and break it into lots of different files. Um, uh, if you're a vendor and you, if you're working with vendor records and you have a lot of them, or working with records from your system and you have a lot of them, a lot of times it makes a lot of sense to work with them in smaller chunks. Uh, the mark split tool allows you to take records and break them up into small chunks like that. Uh, it has some options too. Um, you can set the number of records that you want per file. So by default, it sets itself at a thousand. Um, so uh, it'll only put a thousand records in each file, but you can make that as large or as small as you want. Uh, you can set the number of files that you want to split. So let's say you have a, a file that's 300 gigabytes. Um, you know it's going to create a lot of files, but you're really kind of just wanting to spot check some. So what you're going to do is you're only going to break, you, you're going to break, you only want maybe the first 10,000 records. So you can go ahead and split it up and only take a certain number of records based on the um, uh, number. Only, it'll only give you a certain number of uh, files created from that. Um, and then you can set the file name um, by field data. So by default, MarkEdit um, calls them record uh, files 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Um, if you set the uh, records per file to 1 um, and break it that way, because there's some times where um, I, you, you need to have a single record, um, you can actually uh, tell MarkEdit at that point um, that the uh, file name should be based off of a specific field. It can be a control field, it can be a variable length field. If it's a variable length field, mark it, it will normalize um, the data in that field um, so that uh, it uh, is um, uh, file name uh, friendly. Um, but it'll go ahead and break those out. And so I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna go to the next one and then I'll, I'll pop out again and we'll look at those two. Um, on the join program, this is, um, the companion to the split, it lets you take lots of files um, in either a folder, lots of folders, and join them all together. Uh, there are two specific modes. One is to join individual files, which it allows you to open 
lots of folders and pick individual files to join together. And then one is, um, if you uncheck that, the ability to join files of a specific type within a folder. So let's say I had um, 2,000 uh, full files within a folder and I wanted to join them all together. Um, I could uncheck that box. Um, select uh, uh, MRC as my file type, assuming that's what the file type is that your, your data is stored in. It could be the, uh, bin, dat, whatever it is you're using. And then just tell it to join all that data together and it'll go ahead and uh, join them into a single file. The destination file, which is sometimes confusing and probably not very well named, um, is where the, the join data is going to eventually end up going. Um, and that can actually be an ex a file that already exists. So the, the idea behind this tool is that you could continually append more data to an existing file. So if you have a destination file and you want it to be a new file, you have to essentially tell it you're creating a new file because if you select one that already exists, um, it will just append it'll ask you um, if you want to just append the data or overwrite it um, because there's some assumptions that go on there in terms of why you might want to do one or the other. So let me go ahead and show you very quickly what those uh, what those tools look like, but we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on them. Let's see here, we'll uh, do the same thing. Stop sharing, grab my screen, desktop. There we go. All right. So we're back here. So you have access to um, the split and join file from the uh, from the Mark Tools window. Um, from here, you can see the the um, join and split. Uh, but you also have access to these tools from the main menu, um, join and split. And if you look on my main screen, you'll see that it exists as a standalone tool that you can select um, from the main window. So if you're going to be using a lot a lot you could actually tell the program that you want that to be um, as one of your primary files so um, that's the join so we're going to go ahead and uh, start with the split so split is that it does what it wants what it says it's going to do um, I can pick a file lots of files give it a folder um, I'm not going to go through the process but um, you would give it a folder and then I would tell it you know do I want to how many records do I want to split uh, the joining tool is the opposite I would pick my file and if I pick an existing file it's going to append to it. I would pick the files to join as an individual file. I go in and I can select the files I want to join and it'll pick all those and remember them. If I uncheck that it asks me for file types and the way that the program works changes. So now it's asking me to select a directory and then I'm going to tell it what is the file type that I want to um, what to save to or I want to process and it can be any file type like I said it defaults to MRC because that's what mark edit uses by default for um, for mark file types but I know that OCLC uses um, uh, .dat files when you export from OCLC I know that um, innovative uses dot out files for a lot of their stuff dot bin files tend to come from vendors the extensions are really meaningless as long as the data within the file is um, a uh, mark file you can use that as your file type for processing uh, the second one that we're going to look at here and we're just going to talk about it rather than use it because we're going to make sure i have time to go through everything um, is a tool that was created specifically this was actually created early on um, for before a lot of the the solar based tools were created um, that could process mark records by default um, this is a, a tool for batch processing mark records uh, mark edit occasionally you run into instances where you may have a folder um, of a lot of xml files and you need to turn those xml files into something else like lots of mark files and then you can join them into a bigger mark file what this does is this allows you to process everything within a directory. Um, you can use any tool that MarkEdit understands. So any XML uh, process that you've registered with the tool, MarkEdit can use. Uh, any of the Mark-based tools, MarkEdit can use. And essentially, you just point it at a directory, you tell it what file type you're working in, and then you select, select from a, that big long list there, 
and tell MarkEdit to just process the data. And it will go through and process all of your data. And at the end, it will give you a, a report, a status report about what data was processed and what data couldn't be processed. Uh, this is especially important if you're working with XML data and you're running across XML data that may be invalid. Um, it'll tell you which records um, it couldn't process and how to go through it. And this is accessible from uh, the main window as a, as a process tool. This one I did want to look at. That's why I thought I'd skip the other one. The merge record tool gets used a lot. Um, this is one of these tools that allows you to merge data from one for, that are in two files into one file. Um, some people use this as a way to dedupe large record sets. Um, uh, there is an actual deduping tool, but this will actually allow you to take lots of records in a in a file and collapse them down into a single record. Um, this is also one of those places where you're going to see um, Mark Edit's uh, use of Mark 21 as an assumption. Um, and so we have uh, some specific elements here, um, and and. This actually highlights uh, some of the, the Mark Edit philosophy. Um, I have asked a lot, you know, why can't Mark Edit just work on a source file? Um, I like to create lots of copies. I don't like to, to have um, folks be able to, I, I, wanna, I don't want to be the one that destroys your Mark records. Um, so I try and encourage people to create lots of copies of things. So what Mark Edit does in this process is it's asking you for three files, your source file, merge file, and then a save file. You can tell Mark Edit that the file you want to merge is your source file. So let's say I have a lot of duplicates and I want to collapse them all. Um, I could check that button, merge into a source file, then mark edit will um, shut, it will essentially take away one of the rules that it uses to protect you from, uh, from overwriting and ruining your source file. Um, I can process the uh, source file, which tells mark edit that I'm going to save that process into the source file, which tells it that I'm not going to create a, a secondary save file. So all of the work will happen in your source file, which means when you're done, you will no longer have your original source file. Um, as a general rule, I try to avoid that as much as possible, but there, this, is, this helps you. Um, if you want to go that work, if that's the workflow you want to use, you can go ahead and do that. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, look at um, this particular tool and um, I'll Actually, I have some data to merge so you can see how it works. Okay. So the merge tool um, is available is available from um, here. You can see it under uh, merge records. Um, and we pull this up. So I have a, a set of records that I've, I've set to merge. The uh, records don't have to be identical. Uh, you don't have to have the same number of records in each file. Um, the files that I'm going to look at here, there are roughly, I think there's 9,000 records in one and much fewer, a lot fewer in the other. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and uh, explain how this process works. So the merge file I'm going to use, I'm going to take uh, this one here. My source file, there's a uh, it's uh, 28,000 um, roughly records. My merge file has 9,000. And I'm going to create a save file. All right. And so there are different tools that you can use for merging. You can merge on your 001 field, on an 010, uh, 020, 022, 035, or you can use this option called Mark 21. And honestly, um, I recommend that unless you have a very, very specific reason and know your data really, really well, i.e. there's only a single 001 in all of your files that you're working with, um, just use the Mark 21 option. Uh, the Mark 21 option um, uses a lot of fields for processing. Um, you can see there, these are all of the options that it uses when it's processing the data. Some of them you can uh, add to the process. Um, essentially what Mark Edit does is it creates a really large um, tree that weights the specific data elements here. Um, now what that means is that you can uncheck elements and change the way that Mark Edit matches using the Mark 21 options. Uh, I usually recommend not doing that to start with this and see if it, um, it meets your needs. And if it doesn't, then go through and uncheck the data. And the reason why is um, there are certain elements, unfortunately, that um, are weighed very heavily within the, uh, the tree. And as you uncheck them, it makes it very difficult to automatically rebalance. 
Um, and so I've, I've had folks occasionally ask questions about, you know, I want to uncheck everything but one field. For some fields that works great, for other fields it's, it's problematic. And, and it really comes down to um, the, the, the problems come in terms of balancing that tree. Uh, so I usually recommend stick with the uh, Mark 21 options at least to start. You have three merge options. You can merge all of the unique data, which means MarkEdit will read your entire file, uh, your entire record, and it'll pull anything that's unique into the record. Um, that sometimes means um, that you get record data that's duplicated. So um, it will pull unique. If your control data is not the same, it'll pull that in. Um, so that's usually not the option most people use. Um, merge and overlay it'll take all the data that's in one record just overlay it on top of the other um, also sometimes not the uh, the best one for most uh, folks usually most people are looking to merge selected fields um, so i'm going to go ahead and take the record set that i have i know i want to add uh, a 56 there's one in there but we're pulling another one and then um, there's a 900 and a 999 field which allows us to look at it and see where the merge records happen so we'll go ahead and process it you can see um, the, the process works pretty quickly. Um, I'm not sure if you can actually see the, the counting um, in the, the processor, if it skips quite a bit, but it's going through the, the root and it's done. Um, so now I have my save file, and if I look at my save file, uh, I think it was this one, um, we can look for those specific elements. So you can see in the first record, it, it didn't merge any data into that first record because there's quite a few less than it actually has. But if I um, do a quick search for that 999 field, um, I can see all the way, all the places where it did merge. So we can see that um, within specific records, um, the data that we had asked for, um, specifically uh, the, the two different 856s, there was one presently and we pulled one that was specific to a, a resource as well as the two fields I've asked for have been merged together. Um, the merge tool is actually fairly sophisticated. Uh, it's been refined a number of times and it continues to be refined. Um, but this is one of those where the more people use it, the better and the better feedback I get, the better we can make the, the merge tool work. But I, I find that it's, it's actually, it can be better sometimes, uh, a lot of times than OCLC's merge record tools they do um, within their, their local system. Although, honestly, I'm dealing with a much smaller set of data, so it's a little easier. Um, Let's go back to scheduling. I'm going to try and on schedule, so I'll be able to wrap up here soon and take questions. Uh, let's see here. Uh, that's the merge tool. We just looked at it. Um, there's a tool that uh, in Mark Edit called uh, Mark Compare. It, it, it used to be called Robert Compare. This is something that's been there. Um, has, has used to be in Mark Edit. It was back in Mark Edit 4. It's come back um, recently. This is a way that you can look at to tell the differences between files. So let's say I have uh, two different sets of Mark records, and I know that the Mark records um, are... Uh, I know that there are um, differences between the two, and I want to see what those differences are. Um, I can use this tool to make those comparisons. And where this actually comes in really handy is um, looking at the differences between a record set that's not in RDA and one that has been converted by MarkEdit's RDA helper, or maybe one that you've done by hand. So you can see the differences between the two as a teaching tool. Um, and I actually, uh, uh, have an RDA set of records that we could look at, but I'm going to um, uh, skip it for right now, mostly so that we can finish um, in the next 15 minutes, but I can come back to it if people have questions about it. Um, the tool has a set of preferences. You'll see on the top there are three little links. One is a little bit about the tool. Um, this was written for, this was written a long time ago for somebody and, and brought back for uh, more personal reasons, but I hope people can use it. Um, there's uh, preferences that allow you to change the colors um, of the materials that denote changes, additions, and deletions. If you're familiar with tools um, like uh, the diff tools that give you pluses and minuses as well as color codes that show when things have changed, then you'll be really familiar with the output of this file. Um, and ideally, um, I'm hoping eventually to be able to take this tool and be able to take a, a set of diff files, because I know some people, I've had some use cases presented to me where they manage their data in a uh, source control tool like GitHub and they want to merge changes together. 
um, and this potentially could be a way to use the same engine and merge changes together. That's kind of still being worked on. All right, so bad records. So what happens when you're dealing with bad records? So MarkEdit uses multiple um, mark-breaking algorithms within the application. Uh, used to do a, a poor job of letting you know what was happening. This was a long time ago, um, where the program would just go ahead and try and heal records for you. Now it actually tells you when that happens, um, so that you can decide whether or not the the changes that are um, that have been happened, the the, the 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 healing that it's done actually fixed um, what you were working on. Um, so there's the strict and loose base algorithms, the healing algorithms, and then there's the validator which allows you to figure out what in the world happened to your records. I'm going to show you all of those, and then um, we should have time for questions. Uh, so let me go ahead and show you how this works. All right. So I'm going to take a record. Now, fortunately for us, um, mark records are really easy to break. Um, it's, it, they're hilariously easy to break. Um, and I am going to go ahead and break one. I'm going to open up my handy dandy hex editor, which everybody should have. Let's see here, my hex editor, which is, where'd it go? There it is. I got my hex editor, and we'll open up one of our files, and we will break it. Oh, no, 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 apparently I forgot the hex editor. Nope, no, that's not what I want. Ah, dang it. Hex editor doesn't want to follow. Okay, just a sec. Um, let me just go directly to it. It's here. Um, All right, just a second. I should have done. All right, let me grab my big five file and just drag it in here. There we go. All right, so hex editor. So with the hex editor, I can break a file. So mark edit, mark records. They um, uh, they require you to have specific things in the in the data to tell it how long the records are. I'm going to tell this record that it is one byte long. Um, that was uh, all I needed to do to break this record. And if I do this, um, most um, engines will not be able to um, handle this record anymore. Um, and it'll actually, for a lot of places, stop you from being able to work with the records at, at all. Um, you'll no longer be able to, to do anything with it. Um, so I have my bad file, which I, oh, just a second, I see a comment. Let's see what Uh, why would we break a record using? Oh, sorry. You wouldn't use. You would not break a record using a hex editor. This is just how I'm. I'm using it to um, to make the record bad. I wanted to be able to um, set it up so that you could see um, what happens to a record that's been turned an invalid record. And so I'm. I had to invalidate a record. So this is an invalid record. Um, I changed the leader um, so that it would be invalid. And when I process it, you'll see um, on the screen. You should be able to see it here. Um, this turns red, and this tells you that there were 639 records processed. Um, some of them appear to be invalid, and that's how MarkEdit tells you that it encountered a bad record. Now it went ahead and processed the records anyway. When it ran across this record, it sends it into the loose breaking algorithm, which makes some assumptions to try and heal structural problems within the records. And if we look at this record set, you got to remember this is all in um, Big Five format. I should have grabbed a different record. But you can see that it actually processed and broke the record up correctly. Um, so structural errors, like errors with the leader, um, errors where it's missing a um, uh, end of field or end of record marks, the mark at its loose breaking algorithm can actually handle those. It can handle dangling. Um, dangling uh, subfield markers where you have subfields that are um, invalid. But there's a validating tool that actually will allow you to determine why a record set was invalid. Um, so I can go to the mark validator. And the mark validator has options. So one of them is to validate record. And this takes um, a set of mark 21 rules. It's this rules file here. And will give you back a report based on which fields 
were um, present that maybe shouldn't have been present or repeated that shouldn't have been repeated or subfields or indicators that were used incorrectly. Um, identify invalid records actually tells MarkEdit to figure out all those, find all those records that cause the loose breaking algorithm to get used. And so if I have a file, a vendor file or any file that I've used where I process the data and it tells me that there was an invalid record, um, I can use this tool to then go out and figure out what was wrong with it. In this case, it tells me that the first record is incorrect. Um, it says that the record link doesn't match the reported record link. In this case, there's 295 bytes in the record, and my record set said there was only one byte in the record. And that's obviously um, not right. And so the tool uh, will tell you what the problems are. And for certain problems, I in my experience, I've looked at them and I'll say, oh, for these problems, I, I trust that the, the application's loose breaking algorithm probably handled them right, and I might go on my merry way. If I wanted to actually pull those records out and process them later, um, I can click on the remove invalid records, and it will um, extract the records from the source file and put all the bad records in the same directory as my original source file with a uh, .rb extension at the end of it. So that way, I can work with the files that um, are structurally valid and do whatever editing I need to do with them. And then I can go back and process the invalid records at a later date um, or at a later time and then figure out why those records are invalid. Um, but that allows you to, this allows you to do a number of different um, uh, things. So you have your invalid records, but it also allows you to debug records. So if there are problems, um, the validator works slightly different within the Mark Editor, um, and I'll, I'll just mention that. So from outside the Mark Editor, the program is looking for, um, if you ask it to find invalid records, it's looking for records that tell Mark Edit it needs to use its loose breaking algorithm. From within the Mark Editor, if I use the validator and I tell it to identify invalid records, it's actually looking for records that will not compile. And those would be things where maybe you don't have indicators or you have subfields that lead nowhere or a wide variety of things that might cause problems. Um, and the, the program tries to differentiate those, those differences for you. Um, but that's kind of uh, what ends up happening in terms of deciding um, how that validation works um, one way or the other. And as I, I noted, the, the validator can be used both for validating um, invalid records but also this this validate record types and you have this rules records field everybody has one that used mark edit it's a default rules field that that mark edit uses to structure mark 21 rules um, but it's something that you can modify yourself um, i know a number of folks that use rules files per vendor they're looking for very specific data and so they use custom rules fields to look for specific vendor data. Um, so anyways, uh, so that's how you can tell when you've, you've come across an invalid record. Uh, so that is, I think that is where, I, let me check, I think that's it. Uh, and I think we're in time so folks can ask some questions. So let me make sure. for a couple questions anyway let me make sure I'm right uh, yep okay so um we're coming up on our time so if you um need additional help um and i'll i'll make this available each time uh there are um, three places i generally tend to point people uh, one of them is the mark edit um uh, main page where um all of the stuff is and i i write a lot of um stuff on my my blog occasionally to tell people how to use um, features and new stuff that ends up coming up. Um, YouTube, I record a lot of uh, a lot of questions that get asked. I record um, the answers onto YouTube so that folks um, can find them. And then there's the listserv, um, which is uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 1,500 people strong, um, which answer a lot of questions. And to be honest, there's some people there, especially when you're looking for regular expression answers, that, are, that know how to use the program better than I do. Um, and so, which I find sometimes funny, uh, but they're great about answering questions. Uh, so let's see, what are some of the questions? So I see, um, can you give some additional background on how you came up with the idea for MarkEdit? What are some of the issues and challenges facing the development process? So um, this 